Me personally, um, I've lived in South Africa all my life. I think I'm now third generation. Um, so I was born in what's kind of deemed the third city in, in South Africa, in Durban. Um, was there for a few years and then moved across to another city and then ended up in Cape Town, which is where I spent most of my um, my schooling. From a yeah very um, kind of... Uh, normal family and, and up, upbringing and um i think uh my story in terms of where where architecture came into it i think is probably a little bit boring other than <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> exactly what i knew i wanted to do from a very young age probably from about the age of uh, about the age of six and uh whoa you know maybe it's may, maybe it's maybe it's uh you know someone it certainly aligned my interests and you know i always did enjoy drawing and uh maybe drew elevations and maps to explain things and someone probably said oh you know you should you should be an architect one day and i thought well you know that uh, that makes sense and then probably someone <laughs> else did it and it kind of embedded in my mind and maybe my single-mindedness and my personality that that kind of created a path for me but but in, in many ways I'm, I'm very grateful for it because i um i thought about deviating from that kind of once or twice along the uh, along the way but ultimately um, it kind of suited me. It gave me some artistic freedom and license, but still within some rigor in terms of I was, you know, quite good at math, and um, it, it was really kind of quite a quite a good fit for me. And um, I've never really had to doubt that too much along the way. I, I nearly mm. went to uh, medical school, going into university. I, I studied here in, in in Cape Town, and I kind of had to choose between um, Cape Town Architecture School or um, Stellenbosch uh, med medicine and uh, <laughs> there was there was more of a kind of there was more of a kind of procedural uh, 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 exercise to maybe to uh, uh, appease my my parents somewhat although they were always very supportive of architecture but um, I think obviously you know the um, the esteem of a of a doctor of an architect mm -hmm. is a, mm -hmm. is, a, is a, carries a slightly different weight but ultimately um i always knew that i i wanted to be an architect my my dad um the reason we got moved to cape town used to work for a a, a masonry or a brick manufacturer one of the bigger ones and biggest ones in south africa and uh I did spend a fair bit of uh, until my childhood driving around on Sundays looking at uh, bricks, but obviously <laughs> bricks that were on buildings. <laughs> and I used to think it was quite boring at the time, but I think ultimately maybe there was a there was a, some subliminal learning that was going on and and kind of fueling that uh, um, th that interest. And uh, so I think that that probably played a role somewhere along the way as well. So do you look at brick differently now that you're an architect? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I mean so South Africa is quite a quite a rich tradition of masonry construction. So okay. it's certainly um, very entrenched in in um, the industry here, and, and you can see that represented in the in the architecture. Um, really. So so it's um, it, it is quite a um, a fundamental uh, literal building block of of the way we kind of go things and the way the industry is geared. Um, so so it is quite. Uh, quite important um, in our kind of understanding of things. And not, not to get too deep into the brick conversation, but yeah. are we talking about like the, I mean, I don't know, like the European or whatever kind, like the red brick, the small size one, or is it like a complete different type of brick in South Africa? Uh, it, it is. Um, no, South Africa has obviously got a um, kind of Commonwealth link. So the... Um, it's it's probably not that different it's not the small one um but it's it is quite specific to to here um it is a clay brick um that uh, that gets fired and um yeah so we can treat it in, in many in many different ways um but quite entrenched in our uh in our story but the use of brick is not just a for i guess called traditional structures it's used pretty heavily in even contemporary types of buildings yeah, absolutely. So I think we, um, that's that's always one of the, and I guess we'll kind of dive into that a little bit later. But but um, you know, it's a it's a it's a great end to kind of represent a place is to understand kind of the different um, kind of cornerstones of the industry and how they're used, and then to take that idea and potentially do it in a mm. in a different and interesting way. So so. Um, 
that certainly plays a um, plays a big part. And you know, one of the, we also you know really enjoy working with um, with textures. And so something that a, you know, a brick wall gives you, as opposed to you know, some a, a typical kind of sheetrock surfaces, it's it's not a perfectly sheer, um, sheer surface. It does have a character to it. It does have a, a texture to it, which I think adds. Um, adds a lot to the kind of architectural expression of the of the buildings, and so we try to tap into that, you know, wherever we're working. But certainly, when we're working um, locally or somewhere with a masonry tradition, we we want to kind of um, tie into that. Mm, that's fantastic. Yeah, we'll have to touch more on that. I, I will say that <laughs> recently, uh, the other day, I was thinking that I, I really detest like drywall because <laughs> it just makes it's kind of like the default mater surface material. And so everything just becomes drywall and everything's flat and usually painted white or a gray or something. And it's just, it's not really anything. Like no one uses drywall. Not many people use drywall in like an architectural sense or because drywall has an inherent material texture or property to it. It's just the default. That's what you do when you're trying to be cost effective. It doesn't have any like embedded character, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, um, yeah, that's that's always what we um, are trying to trying to think is you know how can how can you take something as 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 simple as that and do it in a in a in a creative way to yeah. to generate a, a great outcome. Um, so jumping back to the story, uh, but so neither of your parents were necessarily architects or painters or anything in the more creative kind of s space. It seems like. No, not at all. Uh, I think I think that um, they're probably more creative than that they um, led on. You know, I think mm -hmm. they they were both very. Um, neither of them went to university and were very um, insistent that 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 I did and and maybe followed kind of more more practical paths. But I, I definitely think that they they have. Um, uh, you know, uh, undercurrent of, of, of um, artist streaks that are um, that are there. So I, I think I certainly tapped into that. I think um, someone, who, my grandfather, my, um, my mom's side especially, was um, unbelievably creative and inventive with his with his hands. And I think that um, probably um, also uh, guided me in, on, on some levels. But but no, there was. I think there was a you know a very distant uh, uncle and somewhere along the lines who was an architect. But but there was no there was no one that I actively saw as a as a kind of um, mentor that could see what they were doing and and thought that that's you know that that's the, the type of job that I would like to be doing. It was um, it was definitely more of a kind of distant idea. So even at that the younger age of of like when you're a kid, I'm I'm curious what the the general public's like definition or understanding of what an architect does is because we find <laughs> um, in our experience in the States and, and other countries as well that a lot of people don't quite understand what architects do and I don't know what it was when I was a kid that that kind of perception but um, it's just it's an odd profession because it's kind of sits between the lines of the science and also the arts and so it's an odd thing to define it on anyways and I find people don't often graph uh understand it so anyway so when you're a kid like how was it presented to you more on the engineering side or um it was probably um uh, that's a good question you know from my uh it, it probably initially more from an engineering side but i think once i once i kind of got into high school and got into art which was you know a great release for me in um in high school, I mean, I, I was academic, so I'm not, not. It's not in that sense, but I, I really enjoyed that it was just something completely different. And I, I was in a, a boarding house for high school, and used to be able to go instead of being forced to sit in a room and do two hours of homework, I could go to the art class and, and paint for two hours, and it was just a really great release. But but kind of through through that exercise, you then start um, exploring and learning. And I think in in, in that period, it, it shifted from being you know, like drawing, drawing elevations of a building with a ruler to scale to <laughs> being more of a kind of expressive um, kind of field. So it, it kind of morphed somewhere along the way. But I would say initially, it probably started more as a more um, kind of engineering focused um, exercise. But but once I, and as much as I said, I, I knew that was what I, I wanted to be when I realized it could be so much more that that's really was kind of what, um, what set me on my path. Yeah. 
I feel like once you once that door opens, it doesn't get shut again. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, that's it. Okay, there's all this stuff to learn now. I'm going to keep going. Um, so then yeah. you did your B-Arch at the University of Cape Town. When you first started school, or what was school like? Was there anything about it that was surprising or different to you than what you maybe had anticipated or more challenging? Yeah, so... Um... South Africa actually has some some really good architectural schools. I mean, I um, I'm, I'm trying to answer this in a very roundabout way, but you know, I always um, kind of thought when I started working that my my goal was to go and you know go to the US and, and do a um, a master's afterwards. And, and and but but the challenge of that was you know the architectural schools in, in South Africa are, are very good, but the um, they're more, and I, I use the word carefully because I don't want, but they're a little bit more practical. I mean, someone mm -hmm. who comes out of university here can go into an office and can be, you know, very, very useful, very, very quickly, where I think that, you know, some of the more sort of highbrow univers international universities are more um, kind of academic in their, in their thinking. And, and don't get me wrong, I think there's huge, huge value in that. Um, but it was, but they, they are a little bit more kind of hands-on. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe linked to your previous question about, you know, from an engineering to an artistry point of view, um, I was a little bit surprised when I got to um, architecture school and this sounds like a contradiction what I've just told you, but, <laughs> you know, there was, there, was not, there was not a lot of science or mm -hmm. um, math or structure to it. It, it, was, it was a little bit more creative and I, I mean I, I enjoyed that I think you could kind of find your your space to where where, where you where you fit in um, I mean it's also a little bit hard to say you know as a coming from school into university whether you're studying architecture or you're studying accounting I think the whole, the whole experience is so <laughs> so new and great and liberating everything everything just feels like it's uh, you've got this, this uh, freedom that you that you never had um, that you never had before um, but but joining it uh, I think I um, yeah, you, at that point was the first time I started to encounter um, professionals who are were obviously involved in the profession, and um, there were a lot of um, lecturers who were kind of part-time lecturers, part-time professionals, and um, and it was a great way to start to kind of get a feel for what was you know going on in the city, and, and obviously um, my the at the time, and I think we're still grappling with many issues. You know, South Africa is, is complex and um, with you know the the scars of of the past and how those mm -hmm. are resolved, there's still things that we're grappling with, you know, thirty years on. But but it's it's it was it was quite a fascinating space to get into and to kind of uh, you know also my preconceived notions of what it takes or the ingredients to um, to result in a building was kind of turned on its head because you you're dealing with like such kind of broad um macro issues and and kind of input so so mm. it was yeah it was quite fascinating i mean i think it took a bit of settling to kind of um find, find our feet but um but it was a great time i really um i really enjoyed it uh, a lot of um lectures who had certainly had played big roles in my uh, big roles in my sort of career and development and some i'm still in touch with today and um it was a it was a great space so I, I'm curious then, what are some of the specific things that you remember being such a great influence on you? Um, <clears throat> so the <laughs> there was, we had this one we had this one professor who was quite off the wall. Um, <laughs> and I mean we basically could do anything we could do anything. This this the, the only rule he had was you never make someone go up to go down, and I, I, I mean I, I still I, I still think about that that uh, that elective because it was it was it was so you had people building like uh, I mean, you know space transforming umbrellas and you had people building buildings and yeah it was just a complete and that's a you know like crazy spectrum of of, of spaces and, and it was just it was. Um, that had an impact to me just in terms of kind of the, the 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 different level of inquiry that you could kind of pick your point and kind of fit in, and he would give you you know some some rough guidance, which was um, which was interesting. Um, I think one one of the other ones, maybe a little bit later on, that um, certainly had a um, 
big impact on me was uh, there's a practice that they've, they're now on two separate practices, but um, it was uh, Joe Noero and Heinrich Wolf. And um, they, they introduced me to, um, you know, phenomenology and, and architecture and, and sort of some of those theories. And, um, I, you know, I, I obviously I had, it was always a, enjoyed Stephen Hall's work, and mm. um, and then that kind of put it in a in a different light for me that I could understand it better, and uh, that had quite a um, profound influence um, on me at the um, at the time. And um, and then I think the, there was another lecturer, uh, Leslie Loco, who um, who also introduced us to um, some of the um, some of the uh, well, Bernard Chumi and, and, you know, mm-hmm. I think at architecture school, you spend a lot of time trying to work out how you don't have to do architecture and <laughs> <laughs> you start learning about how, how, how these architects became filmmakers and all of the, all the, all the other bits and pieces and yeah. how you can kind of uh, fill your time, not doing, not doing a building, but, but it was, it was still fascinating. And I, I think, you know, you, you, you learn a lot through those experiences and, Sometimes you learn that actually it's pretty cool to just be <laughs> working on a building uh, in, a, in more of your your comfort zone. Um, but but yeah, those, those were probably some of the some of the highlights. I mean, that's a pretty good spectrum just with those few highlights. And it, it does, I, you know, I'd forgotten actually in school, at least my experience, and it sounds like yours as well, that you a lot of times through the electives or the seminars and even studio, you end up like touching a very wide spectrum of different ways of thinking about architecture like in the broadest cultural sense like phenomenology or whatever other many things exist and it's an odd thing because you know now we have our own office and we do what we do that i sometimes forget (laughs) that all that information was learned at some point in time and i think that's that's partly why maybe the transition from school to practice is also a shock for some people uh because in school you're you're learning all the things you mentioned, which is it's like a vast amount of information, and it's in all different directions. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I, and I think you know, I think that's that that's probably in, in my mind the, the biggest part of of just of learning, and uh, is is the, the how you uh, how you filter the information and how you then kind of are able to engage with it. So, I mean, specifically in that that lazy loco like. Um, elective it was really about um, obviously bernard Chumi on the on the filmmaking but also then the um, um i've gone blank cor- uh, corner with the the high line and he he had this mm-hmm. whole kind of urban map- mapping exercise and how distilling quite complex information into a um a drawing that you can then sort of distill and understand and you know while that's like quite removed from from the day to day i think that you know, engaging with something in a way that you can distill it to a format that makes sense for you, for you to kind of move forward with it is a, is a, is quite a valuable skill because I think as a, you know, as an, as an, as an architect and um, when you, you've got so many things being thrown at you, it is a lot of time is, is being able to decipher that information, work out what's, you know, what's, what's the most important or, um, and, and how you can kind of, interlink all of that and, and then return it in a, in a, um, in, in some form of a drawing or building that, that kind of addresses all of those things. So it's, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was quite good fun. We actually, we actually yesterday in the office, um, ironically, there's a, we did an exercise, um, where we brought in, a uh, is a local architect who's actually at, at university, she was ahead of me at the time, but, He's a fantastic um, drawer and um, you know, artist. He's an artist and an architect, and uh, he did a hand drawing workshop with us, which was the most oh, amount wow. of fun I've had in, yeah. in, in an <laughs> unbelievable amount of time. You know, we just um, the way things have moved on and and the way we we work. It was it was a really fun reminder to um, you know to get a little bit looser and to mm. kind of explore some ideas and see where it, where it goes and. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a, we I think we all learned a little bit of a lesson that we we need to make a little bit more room for these non-specific um, mm. exercises that that you know spark uh, segues into into other things. Or and uh, that was really it was uh, a, a lot of fun. Non-specific exercise, I like that. That's a good description because 
I mean, if I think about it, all the a lot of the tools we use, which are basically all related to a computer or an iPad or something like that, they're all very specifically designed for very specific outcomes. And I think I could, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying. I could feel that over a period of time, an architect could become more and more, uh, not maybe not constrained, but yeah, constrained in a sense with almost without knowing it because you, it's, it's a passive thing. You use them every day and then like, you know, months or years go by and you realize that you haven't been able to kind of stretch, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I think, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we are very technology focused and it's, um, uh, it's probably one of our strongest, strongest assets in the way that we, um, we use technology. I mean, you know, 97% of our projects are not in Cape Town. So, so we really, we really rely on it and we've really worked extremely hard to, um, develop systems and tools and, and, and the back and the backbone of all of that is, is, is Revit, which is obviously, um, you know, Autodesk's um, the modeling um, tool. And, but, but one of the challenges I think we all face in the office is, and, and look, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing all that much of the riveting myself um, anymore, but, you know, when you, you try and design and you're picking a wall and you're picking a wall <laughs> that's a certain thickness and it's got, you know, two layers of jib rock and this and whatever, yeah. and, and, so, and it's at a certain height and you draw... And and you you there's so many inputs to draw that line that it's it's it it can be a little bit kind of inhibiting. So I think I think we obviously look to find ways to to work around it. But I think you certainly could get stuck. I mean, and I think that's um, you know certainly something that we take quite seriously is is um, and and again there's a little bit of um, where we're where we where we're from and. You know, maybe uh, our systems in South Africa are not as regimented as a lot of the kind of um, U.S. and European systems are. So for us to do, to build buildings here, we we have a little bit more freedom because, in effect, everything is uh, you know the word custom in in America yeah. you know, means a lot. But but yeah, there's no <laughs> other way. You, you know, it's, it's it's come a long way, but but you know, it's 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 not it's not as um, it's not as regimented. So, so when we're designing buildings, we're purposefully trying to, you know, not make the buildings feel like they're a, um, a result of a collection of these of these systems. We're really right. trying to um, to to make them greater than, um, and and that that ripples kind of all the all the way through. So, so we really put a lot of effort into these design tools. But I think I think there's no question that without um, without the energy to make sure you don't get stuck, that yeah, these these, these these CAD tools could certainly um, bog you down, and so it's, as much as as much as they help you further down the road in the in those initial design phases, it's 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 quite challenging. And, and look, I mean, I know there's more there's there's a whole lot of other software that's a lot more <coughs> fluid, and um, and and certainly those are those are important as well. But um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's it, it's nice to step away every every now and then as well. Do you think that, so would you say in general, based on your experience with, with, you know, in South Africa versus the areas where you guys work in the United States, that in the U.S. there's much more of a, of a tendency or expectation for things to be more kind of systematized or the building to be made up of these kind of preconceived components? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, our, our, uh, our U.S. story started in Miami, which is probably the most extreme example of that because of all of the um, the hurricane requirements yeah. and the. Um, so I mean, you you know, here we here we come where we want to do all of these things, and it's, <laughs> your windows have to be this big by that big, and your millions of, and, and, you, and you're like, well, can you do this? No, can you do that? Absolutely not. Can you? <laughs> so so it's it you know and and um. And of course, some people, some some clients, and some well, if it all comes from the clients. You know, if the clients up for the challenge, then the rest of the team will, will will fall in line. But that comes at a considerable cost. So, so I think you know that's that's the big differentiator is is you know to, for us here to do something custom versus something that's um, you know a specific system. The 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 upside is is not that extreme where in somewhere like the u.s for example as soon as you kind of step somewhere outside of that 
it it kind of really really ramps up. So mm-hmm. I think it, you know, and it, and it does it does make things more more complex and require more time. And so it 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 works on the right projects with the right people. Um, and don't get me wrong, I think the you know the um, working in the US has been fantastic, and there's a really great energy and willingness to to kind of get things get things done but uh, it, there's certainly if you can if you can if you keep in the in the slipstream of the of these systems it, it definitely makes everyone's lives a little bit easier it's just of course that's that's not always where we uh where, where we hope to be yeah i think that's well said i think that's the same feeling that probably most architects have or they had at one point in their lives before they were kind of just worn down by the <laughs> amount of yeah, uh, building code here. and all the stuff yeah. um i mean all the, all the you know like anytime you see a project published that look really nice and they have like very creative ways to do things all the time we're like where are those projects built because <laughs> you would never be able to do yeah. that like you know <laughs> here in california there's just so many like, that doesn't meet code so that doesn't meet code that doesn't meet code <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about like maybe that first project in Miami and how, and maybe even the story of, of the firm briefly, like how did you guys, you know, were a firm from Cape Town and kind of trying to expand to basically worldwide. Uh, and as you mentioned, it seems like most of your work is not in your country, which, you know, is it's very, it's very fascinating. Yeah. Sure. So um, maybe I'll start at the, at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, so it's uh, 37 years old. Um, it was founded in 1985 by Stephen Anthony. Um, yeah, I think in the in the mid in the mid 90s. So about 10 years later, um, Greg and Philip joined Stefan, um, and and then in oh, probably the probably around 20. 10 of the name changed from Stefan Anthony Architects to Serato. Um, and in that process, in that period, um, predominantly since the, from the start till about 2007, um, the majority of work was in South Africa, predominantly in Cape Town. Um, we did start to do some work um, up continent, uh, in specifically in Senegal, um, where, we had, where we had quite a bit of work. Uh, so we had some work uh, work abroad, and then for uh, one of those um, Senegalese clients, we did some work in um, in Geneva. Uh, probably the building finished probably around two thousand and eight, um, and and we'd done good work here. And um, of course, the rest of the world hadn't seen it, and it seems ridiculous to say this uh, today. But you know, <laughs> in two thousand and eight, when when um, there was that there was. The, the, that financial crash that happened um, around, around the world. It was also at the time where um, online blogs were becoming a thing, and there were <laughs> online magazines, and and there seemed to be a little bit of a kind of a drop off in, in content. And and this online blog, Cool Hunter, found this mm-hmm. project of ours in Geneva and <laughs> featured it, and everyone loved it. And we had 15 years of beautifully photographed work that no one in the world had ever seen before Interesting. and it was just kind of that you know just the enemy just kind of rode this this online what was at the time quite a sort of early online wave of, of, of um of work that we were able to kind of surface um and off the back of that the phone started ringing from uh we've had some work we, we also were busy with some uh hospitality work in uh the seychelles at the time but then we picked up some work in dubai um, we picked up some more work in Geneva, uh, and and then in 2012 we got our first call from uh, on that project in Miami. Um, the story goes that the reason the phone rang was that our client's girlfriend at the time was putting a Pinterest board together, and all of our work was uh, <laughs> uh, was flooded this Pinterest board. And the and the building contractor Barry said, "Well, you know, why don't you just phone these guys, see what happens?" and uh, and yeah, they well, I think they emailed, and we replied with uh, our beautifully formatted emails and eloquent, eloquent English, and uh, and the rest is history. I mean, I, uh, that wow. was, and on that that um, so, so to parallel story to that. So the, the structure of the of the of the office is um, so the obviously Stefan, Greg, and Philip were the founding partners um, along the way. Um, Philippe and myself. 
uh, joined, and then Logan, uh, our financial director, and more recently Roxanne. Um, so the seven principles. Um, Stefan still is, is very. He doesn't have a project team, but he we, we refer to him as the chairman. But I don't think he, he likes the term. It's not <laughs> not the right term. But, but he 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 he's he's very involved across the kind of um, broader um, setup of the of the office and all things designed to. Um, then Logan, our financial director, and then there are five architectural teams that range from you know twenty to. 45 people. So we're 250 people wow. um, all together. Wait, so um, th- real quick, so the, the, the 245, is that a current stat? And if so, what was, how large were you guys in, you know, 2008 or 2012 or that kind of range? Yeah, so, so 250 was as of today. I checked before today's, uh, <laughs> before today's call. Um, I joined the firm in 2007, and I think at the time we were about 60. Wow. Um, wow. So, so it's yeah. It's, it's the the international work has it changed everything for us. Yeah. Um, and so that that was a that was a, a real sort of game changer. Um, and so within these five teams, those teams predominantly serve a specific regions. So we don't have a hospitality department or a commercial department or a residential department. We, we, we more consolidate the knowledge into the regions and the relationships we've, we've, um, we've kind of built along the way. So, um, so my, I look after most of our work in the U S we, uh, Philip and I, Philip still has, uh, does um, quite a bit of work in, in, in Florida, um, just due to the, the sheer quantity of work. But, you know, that, that phone call in my, to, from Miami changed, changed my, changed my life. I mean, that, that was kind of the start of, um, of, of the, of the U S work. And that sort of certainly started my trajectory towards, a, um, becoming a, a partner and a principal. Um, and yeah, we picked up some work in Miami fairly quickly. We went from kind of one to four projects quite fast. We got some work on, um, in the Hamptons mm-hmm. and then, uh, and then the West coast just, um, took off. There was a, there was a code change happening, I think, in 2016, and and we had um, we had one project, and I think within the space of about three weeks, we went from one to to seven, and um, and it was just it was just absolute chaos. I mean, it was um, but but great, and and obviously Los Angeles and Cape Town, you know, both share a Mediterranean climate, mm-hmm. so it was a it just always felt like a like an easy um like an easy fit for our buildings and the and kind of the um yeah what the, the life that are, that that you can live in that environment and what our, our buildings are able to kind of facilitate that so so that was a very sort of comfortable fit and yeah since then um obviously what's happened since covid florida has been you know one of the biggest markets in mm-hmm. our uh, in the practice overall for the last um it, it's tapered off now for a little bit but certainly the preceding um three years was was really very very strong i um, mean we got some work in aspen and dallas and phoenix uh and uh san diego <laughs> so quite a quite a quite a nice um quite a quite a nice spread and yeah we've really um really enjoying it it's been a it's been a great market to um to work in that's very interesting. Um, and then real quick, but uh, the, the sort of comparison between L.A. and Cape Town also applies, if I'm not mistaken, because in Cape Town, you guys have some really crazy hillsides and cliffs. Yeah. And so you're probably used to doing houses in Complex. site locations like that, which is, of course, very actually probably easier in, in terms of topography, uh, but, but similar in L.A., like Beverly Hills and those kinds of places. Yes, it's, it's it is it is very similar. It's uh, we don't have the we don't have the the grading code challenges that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, yeah, you're missing uh, out. So that makes it that, that makes that makes it easier. But um, but yeah, I kind of describe Cape Town, um, and I mean it's it's a really special place, an absolutely beautiful city. Um, it's it's kind of a um, it's a it, it feels in some ways. Um, a little bit like San Francisco, but with with LA's weather, it's kind of somewhere somewhere in the middle. But mm-hmm. yeah, essentially, there's a there's a bay and a mountain range that creates this kind of um, bowl, and on either side of the mountain range, you've you've kind of got ocean views. So it's it, it is it is very it is quite steep and um and a, and a very sort of similar similar feel to it. 
Yeah. And a lot of modern or contemporary, yeah. whatever you would call it, types of structures, which I didn't know until yes. you know the last three years that that was the case. Yeah. And I think that's that's also, uh, you know, my comment earlier about us having um, good architecture schools. There's a there's a there's a lot of talented architects in, mm -hmm. in, in the city. And um, uh, I think probably similar to us is, you know, just being um, inspired by by the surroundings and, and kind of using that to kind of inform the um, the design of the buildings, which I think is um, makes makes a big difference. But mm. Yeah, I mean it's it's probably a lot smaller than you than you realize, but it's uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's quite a, a concentration of it in the in the sort of um, the top areas. Yeah, it's pretty amazing though that the the way you guys started in the U.S. was through this blog and this Pinterest and this lady finding you that way. I mean, it is it's such an awesome. I story. remember Cool Hunter. I don't know if Cool Hunter is still around though. I don't know. Oh, they were yeah, like one of the I few blogs that was really cool. Are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no we uh, we owe them a lot. <laughs> Did you? But so, so you had you guys had been doing work kind of like in other countries, so you were kind of used to like you know work in a place that was different with different maybe standards and expectations and where things are put together. Was mm. the U.S. market in comparison to the other places you have had done work before? Was it? more complicated to get into like was i mean i, I don't know yeah. was it like very different than than the other places or not so much um y yes and no i mean i, I think <clears throat> often my my sales pitch to new clients they're like how are you going to understand the yeah. the building code in this place <laughs> it's so difficult and i'm and, you know and, and, and my answer is you know this is this is kind of what we this is what we do the intent of a, of a, certainly on a zoning building code wherever you are in the world is the same. How high can you go? How close <laughs> to the property lines can you go? What's the definition of a basement? You, you know, we, we know we, you, can, you can get to grips with that um, pretty quickly. And the one thing I can tell you is that Cape Town has an extremely, extremely complex um, zoning code. So I feel like that also, that also helped us. I think that, that you know, the, the next part of it is obviously the, the, the actual, the practicalities of, of the kind of construction um, industry and, and and expectations and so I think the you know, the other very important part of for you to maybe understand is the um, our working model is obviously we you know with us being here we don't believe that there's an issue for the during the design phases of the project but we do acknowledge that at a point in time certainly under construction you know yeah. we, we you can't do that you can't do that remotely um, and so we also don't pretend that we that we know everything so we we always work with a locally based um, architect record which is a very important um aspect to the business model a very important relationship to us and and it's not a it's not a standoff relationship it's mm -hmm. a very um it's a very um uh collaborative and appreciative um relationship because you know it's always about finding you know finding the right um, you know the right mix and the right people, and we've we've worked with just some of the most amazing um, people that you can you know that you can imagine. And so we're not necessarily going into this without support. So I think that, you know obviously we a, a big thing is is again you know how, how architects desire information is asking the right questions at the yeah. at the right time. And so so you kind of learn along the way. Um, you know what are those are, are those questions? But um, and and I think that it is also not pretending to to understand it but um i think i think also what what is in what has been interesting for us is um and i think we've worked now in an array that we kind of understand the the different realms but you know obviously for instance working in um working in miami with the hurricane and you know that the the building is going to be a concrete a concrete structure that the engineers are going to put a, a lot of concrete on it in, in on the west coast you've got the earthquakes to deal with so that everything needs to be lightweight and you, you kind of in a steel frame um scenario so i think uh, you, you know we've you, we've learned to understand that early and to help use that to also inform the design because um you, you can't you, you need to kind of take those those things on board and you know places like um like dubai as well has a also has a um, you know, very specific methodology in terms of the way things are are, are built, and you know how you're going to 
design something to get a good result. You know, all of these things do come with a little bit of time, but I think the most important thing is that it's, it's, we never pretend to, yeah. to understand it all and to, to really enlist that support and, and make sure that we've got the right people around the table when we, um, when we were going through the process. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, um, subject because <clears throat> I mean, we found even when we're acting as the executive architect, there's still a lot of, um, calling up the other project stakeholders or colleagues that are not on the project and asking for input advice or their expertise. And I think more of that way of working in general is going to be more commonplace because one reason is that building codes are just becoming more and more complex. And I don't think they're going to become mm. less complex <laughs> as time goes yeah. on. And I, so I think like sort of the specialization of, uh, of architecture, like architecture is going to get split um, in a way to a bunch of different uh, specialized folks, um, which can be a positive thing if everyone has the right mentality about it. Um, I think it is dangerous though when there's a um, uh, like we've I've operated as a as a non-local design architect before, and in that process, I think it is dangerous when there's a as you were alluding to that there's a, a kind of a, a split or not a lot of conversation between the design architect and the local or executive architect. I think that gets really mm -hmm. strange. Like if we've had people, sometimes clients think like, well, if you're the design architect and you do a really nice set of design drawings or de design development drawings, can you just hand it off to the local architect and then I'll, I'll see you later, <laughs> you know? And it's like, no, no exactly. not, that's not a good idea. We're, we're not going to do that. <laughs> no, I, I mean, and I, and I, I think it's, yeah, it's 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 a little bit un, unfair at times, but yeah, that's that's often the perception is you know why why do, why would we need why would we need these guys? You guys have done the design, just give them your 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 revit, your revit file, and, and, and so so you spend a lot of time explaining the value, uh, you know, the, the value and the importance of it. I mean, you, you start we started out talking a little bit about um, what the. Uh, kind of public's perception of an architect is, and I always find that hilarious because on one hand, on one hand you say you're an architect, and everyone and there's you know oh that's 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 cool, that's that's a that, that's a really cool thing to do, and um, and then on the other hand it's like you know the you know the stupid architect forgot to like put you know whatever this hinge into a, into a door, and you, now you're going from there's this expectation that there's like <laughs> This artist, like wide scale, massive, big, big picture sketch in a napkin designer, yeah. but at the same time, it was like the responsibility to have, you know, yeah. carried through every single little last, like final, you know, you know check of it. So, mm -hmm. so there's somewhere in there, there's a, there's a, there's quite a like broad, mis, you know, misunderstanding of of kind of what the um, the, the level, the different levels of inputs that are required along the way, and, and I mean it is. Um, you, you know, the, the going through those construction phases is, is, is grueling. And mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, you know, I think the, the one thing I, I would, would say, which I, I, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of your, um, your U.S. colleagues um, who hear this might, might shake their heads, but, you know, the, the, the infrastructure that the GCs have um, in most of the projects that we've encountered in the U.S. is, is quite impressive. I mean, you know, when we... I mean, I like him working here to being design build because, hmm. um, you know, the, it's the architect is really expected to, you know, to do a lot of the what in the US a lot of the legwork that the the, the, the general contractor would do. Hmm. Um, that's a, the expectation that you know that all gets handed by by, by the architect here. So it's it's quite a it's it's, it's a little bit of a, a strange one that it's you know the, the web is just so wide in terms of you know, what, uh, what, uh, what the, the expectations are. Wait, so what are some of the things that an architect would typically do in South Africa that a contractor would do in the U S generally from what you've seen? I mean, the simplest example is you would have your, uh, you know, your fortnightly site meeting. Uh, it would be the architect who's, who is taking those minutes and issuing them and mm. making sure that it would be the architect that's phoning up uh you know all of the suppliers to get the to get the control samples you know the, the levels of inspections that would happen throughout the process you know <laughs> most of those would be would be done 
by you know by by the Arctic. To I think in the US, of course, the Arctic may be involved. Kind of maybe at step three to kind of go through it. So it's just it's just a, a huge administrative kind of um, burden. And and beyond that, the the skill set on the um, on the contractor side uh, is 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 not as um, advanced as what it is in the US. I mean, I'm often encountering people in the in the GCs team who are actually trained as as architects. So I'm not taking away anything from the contractors here. The, the guys are are smart and they know how to how to build, but they um, you, you know, there's a very it's it's the the administrative side and keeping the ball rolling and that is 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 often you know a little bit uh, left behind. So the architect ends up coming in to to kind of prop that up to right. um, to fulfill a lot of that that um, those requirements. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating because this is the kind of the specifics vary greatly, obviously from country to country, but even just just from architect to architect, contractor to contractor, and also depending on what scale, uh, what um, level of execution you're doing. And and I think therefore it's also very confusing for clients because they're like, well, I hear yeah. this one thing, but you're saying something different and they're saying something different. So what do I, how do I know what, what I should be doing here? Yeah. <laughs> it's, well, well, well. I mean, I think you also that that raises another point, which is I think one of been one of our biggest challenges, specifically in the US, is in, and again this kind of uh, Commonwealth background of South Africa. You know, in mm. here, a client buys a property, decides he wants to build. Hopefully, he phones the architect first, but the second person he phones is a quantity surveyor, which is effectively a cost estimator. Mm. And they are an independent third party. And, you know, from the architect's first sketch, he's saying, they're quantitative surveyors saying, hey, this thing's going to cost, you know, uh, X. And the client says, okay, no, that's way too much to have it. But, but it's, a, it's an independent person mm. whose sole purpose in the project from start to finish is to manage the cost of the, of the, of the project. So, so that's been really difficult for us in the in the US, and and of course we work with we work with great GCs, but they often aren't on board, you know, that that early. And you, you do your best to kind of <clears throat> caution what you think things are going to cost and what we've seen things are costing on other projects. But you know, a lot of the time, it's like, well, hey, you know, thank you, Mister Outsider, but can you go and get <laughs> back in your box and do some drawings? You know, you know, you know yeah. my, my friend, my friend, my friend Joe bought for you know whatever, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then you lo and behold, lo and behold, two months later, and and then we've got a GC, and the numbers are you, you know what uh, what we expected them to be, and it's a big and it's a big problem. And then you've got to kind of go back and redesign, and yeah. you know, you, 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 the, the, I mean, the, the poor clients have seen something that they loved, and now you need to tell them that they can't have all of these things. So, so that's been really difficult for us because it's a it's a little bit more. Um, yeah, having that person in your as part of the team um, is really helpful because it, that's kind of the, the best way to streamline a project is to is to make sure that you you, you are and look. I'm not saying that we don't end up with <laughs> with overruns and, sure. and things costing sure. uh, <laughs> costing more and the rest of it, but it certainly um, it certainly gives you a lot of uh, um, guidance along the way. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that's been, that's been quite tough for us. Or so are the estimators you work with in South Africa, are they usually pretty close? I mean, close enough to where their, their numbers make sense. Cause that's always the, that's one of the fears I think is if you use an outside estimator, um, if we were to use one and let's say we didn't know them, that the contractor who does get hired is going to be like, I don't know who gave you these numbers, but this is not, this is, these are not my numbers. So no. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, they, they they can be, they, they, and as long as you listen to them, they they, <laughs> they, are, they are pretty they're pretty close. Um, I, I think also it does change the dynamic with the contractor um, somewhat because what would typically happen here is you would <clears throat> there would be no uh, in some cases you would negotiate with the contractor, but a lot of the time the contractor wouldn't be at the table until you had a sort of bid set that you could then kind of competitive competitively go out and mm -hmm. and and bid so you know we obviously because you, you didn't you didn't need the gc to 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 give you the pricing for you to kind of get there so it's it's always uh so that's that's generally the, the, the you know the way it works i do think there's merits in um if you because you know i think 
so often you know, finding a relationship and someone that you can work with as a GC is, is really important. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's going to be, there's going to be tough times along the way, but as long as you can have it out and, and carry on, you know, that's, that's really the, the most important. And I even think sometimes, you know, playing to someone like if there's trust and playing to their strengths in the, in the design has also got a huge amount of um, merits and gets a lot of, of goodwill. And so, so there's certainly a space for that for the, for that environment as well. It's just um, I think it's especially hard for us as maybe as you know not being local that maybe you know some of our clients don't take what we we say um, seriously enough in terms of mm-hmm. the the cost exercise. But it, it is it is it is very helpful having someone like that on the on the team. Yeah, the the thing that we see <clears throat> that's related to this con- part of the conversation is more and more. Um, contractors, they probably always wanted this, frankly, but them being hired uh, to do pre-construction, which I'm sure you, you're, mm. you're aware of this. And um, so the contractors, you know, semi on the team from like day zero, let's say, and they're used as the estimator and they're used for also building or construction feasibility and construction issue um, feedback throughout throughout design and throughout the entire process uh, prior to CDs. Um, I think it's it's... It's becoming more common, but it's it's still a challenge, right? Because if you're a contractor, you don't necessarily want to do pre-con unless you have a really good chance of getting the project because it's not lucrative to do mm. pre-con for you know the hourly rate or whatever, and then have the client bid it out to four or five contractors and you lose the job. Um, so yeah, the estimator thing is an interesting question. I mean, usually we either convince the client to bring on the contract at the beginning, someone that we know and trust, or... We call favors <laughs> to contractors yeah. and say, "Hey, I know you have an estimator in house. You know, can we pay them whatever amount of money for some time to get some eyes on something? It'd be nice to have an estimator system, though. It'd be very much more convenient." Yeah, yeah. No, we've we've done a few of the of with the with the contractors, and some of them have been quite creative in terms of you know rolling in their pre-con fee if they if they get the job and yeah that that's been right. a great help i mean that's that's the only way we 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 can we can make it make it work so yeah it's just uh, i think sometimes it's they they get to the table a little bit late or and and sometimes it's quite frustrating because they want to see engineering drawings before they give you any numbers yeah. <laughs> and it's that, you, you know you, it's like, oh, we, you know to get to that point we've already sunk you know far too much into this project we, we need kind of more elemental steps to kind of build us uh yeah. build us up to that but 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 yeah that that's uh that that is a model that we, we we try work with when we when we can it always feels like it's a chicken or the egg question or, or dance um, at the beginning everyone's like what's the budget what's the budget how can we do it how much can we have and no one's everyone's like i don't know i need drawings i need to yeah. know the budget i need drawings and <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's sometimes messy um so but when you're uh, operating as uh, I guess called the design architect, and you have a local executive architect. Um, I'm wondering what happens specifically with, let's say, construction drawings. So does the local architect produce the CDs, and you guys, I, I presume, still look at them and have comments on them? Yes, uh, I mean that's always our um, our goal. We like to be we we like to be kept involved. Um, but, but yeah, that's that's essentially the um, the, the, the setup, and uh, you know, depending on the, on the obviously the construction phase goes is, is initially a bit of a, a slow burn, and then when you start getting to all the kind of signing off of finishes or critical shop drawings or things, then, then you know we'll get kind of looped back in. Um, but we like to stay, we like to stay involved um, as much as um, uh, you know the owners will, will let us. And, and again, it's you know some people absolutely insist and others are, uh, are, are, are kind of less willing for for whatever reason. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, we, 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 we like to, to see how everything goes all the way through. How does that work for the interiors though? Like do, you, do the um, executive architect that you work with also develop sort of the detailing for the interiors as well? Or can you guys provide these drawings? Like, I think it's pretty clear from like an architectural standpoint, like, you know, the different building standards and, and kind of way of, of constructing it. But even just down to like how you build things on the interiors, that might vary too mm-hmm. between countries. Yeah. Well, interesting. This is another, this is another um, 
<laughs> example of what I just described with the with the contractors. <laughs> so, so, you know, here and our, our our background has been, you know, we we detail everything. Yeah. So, um, so we've always done, and and, of, and I think when you uh, hopefully when you look at our, our buildings, you know, the relationship of the interior and the exterior there's a very close link, and it's the same idea, it's the same language, and we want spaces to feel like they aren't just you know whatever's within the the walls of the building so mm-hmm. so the the relationship between specifically the interior architecture and the uh, and the and the architecture itself for us is is very close and so we we would often in most of our projects offer that as part of our service that we would do um we would take the the design of the architecture and the interior architecture up to the end of, of design development so depending where we are and depending on the on the local architects um you know, we, we have found in 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 a lot of the um, more sophisticated markets that the, there is this very clear distinction, yeah. and, and a lot of architects will not touch the um, in inter- interior architecture, um, which we found a lot of in the US, certainly in the Middle East, and um, and some of the European as well. So that that is sometimes a little bit of a challenge for us to find that. Um, and the, the, the often we get we, we, we scope gap of you know who's going to do the construction yeah. documents of the of the interior architecture so um but we we have found some some people who are happy to kind of um to to take that on if we if we if we get stuck um also local so not not us um we we still we still and also i think the you know the and again back to the the, the systems the way the way that it, a pack of drawings in the U.S. sort of arrives at a at a job site. There's quite a particular framework and setup, and and that's not something that we that that we know. So uh, again, it, is, uh, it also feels like that needs to be needs to be uh, needs to be done locally. But um, that that is also quite a common conversation we're having in, in terms of um, how that's going to work on a specific um, project. There, there are, there are instances in many instances where we also work with interior designers where our scope is limited to the, um, the architecture only. Mm-hmm. Um, that's obviously resolves that, 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 yeah. um, that <laughs> sure. issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, uh, it's interesting because for us, we prefer to do, we're more in, in your wavelength of doing the architecture and at, at least also the interior architecture. So we always produce f- like full CDs for both. And uh, sometimes mm-hmm. I forget that uh, there are a lot of architects in the US and I think a growing number who prefer not to touch any of the interiors, even the interior architecture. Well, especially on the West Coast. I mean, we have strong experience and background on the East Coast where, uh, you know, a lot of offices do everything in-house, like design well, a house in no... the Hamptons, yeah, yeah. you know, you do the architecture, but you also do the interiors, where California, specifically from our experience, seems to be a bit more divorced between the interior of a building and the exterior of a building, which still doesn't make sense perplexing. to me. Yeah. But... <laughs> well, and, and I, think, I think it's kind of been exacerbated by the um by the vendors because i think you get a lot of the yeah. vendors now who who are able to take on a considerable portion of the interior scope i mean again this conversation about custom or not uh, i think mm. on the hampton side you've got those kind of master craftsmen who will do anything for you it's going to cost you <laughs> your, an arm and a leg but it's going to be magnificent and it's going to be beautifully where where maybe on 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 the west coast it's you know the it's it's more it seems to be more geared or having been pushed more towards this kind of vendor model where you can go to someone who can you know do your closets and your bathrooms yeah. and your kitchen and your and then and then the owner's like well you know what's what's left what's the point and and so that, yeah. that's also quite frustrating because what's left is actually very important because that's how it all really kind of ties together and doesn't look like a showroom, but it, you know, so it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it is a, it is a tough one and, and something that, that we, um, that, that is a challenge. Yeah. It's, uh, it, we were contemplating this recently because, um, there are a lot of, uh, vendors who produce very high quality, you know, closets or kitchens or whatever they are. And a lot, some of them now have enough options to where it start. You start to wonder, is this custom? But then it's, yeah. but it's not custom. But it sort of is. Mm. And yeah, it's it's an odd. I don't know how I feel about it. As my answer, it's an odd. It's an odd thing. 
is an odd thing because sometimes also the, the details that they can kick out or, or have, let's say in their, you know, storage systems are like, it, it's a custom built kitchen would be hard to compete with some of these storage devices and things because they have an entire company and research division dedicated just to figuring out the best way to store silverware or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I think a lot of them are kind of cottoning onto what your comments about the, is it custom? Is it, you know, and, and I think you, you're starting to see, I mean, some of the brands specifically, that's kind of become their, their selling points is, you know, mm -hmm. that they are willing to, um, customize and your, you know, cause, because I think that, that is what, that is really what, the, what, what elevates it, um, is, is that, you know, sure, you're going to stick to the things that they, like you say, the, that they can, that they can produce and are immaculate in their, their work, but you know, how it does tie into the rest of the mm -hmm. building, um, is an issue. I mean, my, my, my favorite is obviously, you know, you go to all of these, these these closets and then you want a wall panel to match the the, the <laughs> closet but then you've got the door and do you think you can get those three you know <laughs> panels to be the yeah. same material and, and the answer is generally absolutely not and, yeah. it's, and so so i think you, you're starting to find the, the the a lot of these ranges now um have recognized that and are, are kind of broadening their um their, their scope but i i still think that there's there, there needs to be a there needs to be a quarterback in the in the room to kind of make sure all of those things can kind of tie together. You know, expecting the, the contractors do a, do a, do a good job, but but it um, you know it does it does still need kind of a considerable sort of oversight in, in terms of how it all fits in. Oh, I, I definitely agree. And actually, uh, uh, in my view, the good contractors, if the client asks them to do that, they'll be like, "No way, I'm not. I'm not making yeah. decisions on, on that. That's not what I do." I don't want to have those kind of discussions with you. Um, yeah. I, I just want to be told, you know, to do something at a high execution. Um, I was wondering, designing, well, I guess I guess a couple of questions. Uh, the first was, so let's say you have a client who is in a, a different part of the world from you guys, from, from, from Cape Town, from South Africa, and they're considering you as an architect, but they're hesitant because you're not local. Um, and I think you probably, you touched on this earlier about maybe the concerns being more about technical expertise or knowledge about uh, building codes and whatnot. Are there other things that you often see as a challenge from the client's uh, perspective um, where they're just hesitant to use someone that's, you know, not, not within a three block radius sometimes I find. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, well, I mean, obviously, what's happened in the last five years is, is changed, is is, yeah. is swung that the the other way. Um, mm. And then, so every, everyone's used to communicating like this, so it's it's not as foreign it was as what it was ten years ago. Um, no, not really. I mean, I, I think I, I think it's it's uh, a lot of the time the the, the clients are. Um, Either they know that we're in Cape Town, or sometimes they, they are quite surprised. <laughs> um, you know what? I, or obviously, my happily kind of share share references with with clients, and um, and it's very important to us that they, that that an owner kind of enjoys the um, the experience. And mm -hmm. I think what what's quite strange and maybe not always apparent is in this kind of model of of the kind of call it the um the the designer and then the architect of record scenarios it's in everyone's interest to make as many design decisions up front as possible so the points in time that we kind of hand over to the the architect of record mm -hmm. they've got what they need to produce a set of drawings the client's got what he they need he or she needs to understand what the building is and, and looks like um and and i think that's quite a kind of mind shift because, you know, obviously building your home is an extremely stressful thing and nothing's more stressful than being under pressure to make a decision. And I think, I think being in that position that you can have had quite an intensive design period, um, up front and, uh, a very good idea of what's, of, of what it's going to be takes a lot of that, a lot of that pressure off. So, so that's mm. been, that's been quite, mm. um, that's been quite important. Um, and, and obviously, you know, this is sort of the, 
the the conference call nature of things is is very frequent and, and happens a lot but you know with the with the volume of work you know I'm, I'm in the US probably every quarter and so for important meetings um you know we still definitely make time to um to to meet around the table and and get to know each other and of course just to see that spend some time on the on the properties as well so you know that that all sort of still happens so i think i think there's i think there's hesitation until they can kind of get a feel for for us and i think in those early interactions and just kind of understanding the way we um we work and and you know we are very we're very big on our systems and i, I joked about our email earlier but you know from from the systems and the processes and asking the questions and the in the kind of sequence you do i think um i think clients will start to feel um you know at ease that that mm-hmm. that this isn't as kind of um an off the wall idea as they they might have thought in the in the beginning right right i i could see that i could see that I'm sure you guys have thought about it, but if you have so much work in the U.S., then wouldn't it make sense to open offices here? <laughs> we probably talk about that every, every two days. No, 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 busy, not every two days. At least twice a year. Yeah. yeah. At least twice a year. You know, the, um, I think as a business, we would, you know, we're very ambitious and um, we would love to have a, uh, to have a, a, a more kind of international um, mm. company um, and certainly as you say with all the internet with all the international work you would think that that would make sense but you know we we can't we we really struggle <laughs> to get it to make sense we have you know obviously Cape Town is, is special to us and it's home and so um, the but but on a even on a purely kind of um, business point of view we have access to great people um, we have a great quality of life here which is you know a fraction of the cost of of yeah. um what it would cost to live that quality of life in you know la for instance or, or sydney australia or anywhere else with a kind of similar sort of feel to it and um yeah we we really struggle to you know to get those um to, for us to make the numbers work yeah um which is which is strange but that that is really the reality i think if we if we find a way to do that we um we certainly would do it i mean we do ask ourselves a lot you know what are we and this is obviously linked to your initial question is you know is, is the apprehension of using us what are we missing out on by not being by not being there and that's obviously quite an you know intangible thing but i think i think coming from a place where um you know the um the, the value for money and quality of life is kind of so low relative to that it's just such a kind of eye-watering thought to you know to to kind of go or to embark on one of these these journeys so so it, we, we really just haven't really managed to get it made to make sense i mean it's sort of like if if the system was working super well then well and also maybe it makes you even more appealing to clients if you're not local and you know kind of trying to preserve that identity yeah like if you yeah. change that you might change the there, whole company yeah no there's there's absolutely there's absolutely an element of that and i think in certain markets you know being the shiny new thing has has appeal in other markets it's it's the opposite it's yeah. where, where there's a lot more kind of homegrown mentality and it's it's you know that there's just no interest um and i mean that's uh, and of course that's that's fine but uh, i think that i think there is part i think there is part of that um i've had many i have many many clients trying to um trying to come up with scenario very very um <laughs> good businessmen coming up with scenarios of how, how we can how we should be making this work but uh we, we still haven't cracked it yet it's an interesting thing i think uh, for me like there, i remember we had a I was speaking to an architect not long ago and they had made the statement very adamantly that you know architects should kind of only stick to their turf and only do work in their uh well, i guess basically where they are because that's where they understand mm. that place understand the climate understand the codes understand the cultural sensitivities understand uh, whatever else is kind of you know seeping through the skin and um and obviously i can understand the the reasons like he that it was mentioned but at the same time, I don't know if I have a good reason behind it, but I strongly disagree. <laughs> I just think there's, because I think there's wonderful value to having someone who's 
not local local and sometimes it's to the extreme of like you need to be in my you know micro city neighborhood uh, which is like absurd i think but um i think there's great value to have someone who's not that local come in because they can have a different a different perspective help shade things up bring to the table something different kind of force change because i do think that this is kind of getting to what you're saying earlier of um, I, I do think that when, if you're an architect practicing in a place, you get kind of used to doing something over and over again because that's just what you do and maybe the easier path in, in a way. And then to have someone else say, well, just why don't we try this same... weird thing? And then it's their job yeah. to say no. And then it's your job to say, well, let's figure out a way to do it different still. Um, let's you know. not use that Revit wall that everybody yeah, yeah. is using. Or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> default to the smallest size window for hurricane uh, standards or, or whatever the situation well, is. Well, and yeah. the interesting thing too is the kind of the cross-pollination of, yeah. of ideas from different people in different places. And I think actually the relationship of like, you know, maybe the design architect, executive architect, meaning local and not local, to me is super interesting because it could make the outcome very unique. Yeah. Uh, and, and richer than what a local guy could have done, you know? And I'm thinking about that too from my experience, right? I, 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 I'm from France, but I studied in the US and that completely blew my mind away to see how people were doing things in another place. And I'm thinking like, yeah. you know? No, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I, agree. Disagree too. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, but, but I mean, the, the, the thing is, I mean, at what level do you engage with, with, with something like that? Because in my mind, yeah. you know, it goes all the way down to the best idea wins. Yeah. You know, who cares who made it? Who cares where you're from? Who cares what you thought? If you've got a great idea and it's the best idea, then, you know, get on, everybody get on board and, you know, let's, uh, you, you know, let's, let's, let's do it. And I think, so, so, I mean, I, I, I think, and again, I, I also potentially, it's also about the attitude of it. I think, you know, in certainly in the way that we, you know, we've, we've certainly got a sort of design ethos that we, that we, you know, bring to, bring to projects. That's, that's not, not like a manifesto or anything, but I think as an approach to making buildings that are, I certainly are informed by the by the by the site and the location and the and the and the culture and I, and I think we would never pretend to be the experts on any of those things in a place that isn't where, we, where we're from and, and again it's about getting that you know getting the getting the right information and asking the right people and and, and making sound decisions but uh, yeah I mean I think whether you, you know we we are of course us as a practice always it's a tell our clients how you know we're opinionated about all things design if you ask us or if you ask me i'm going to give you i'm going to give you an opinion <laughs> but at the same time if someone else if someone else wants to come and and and, and give theirs you know if, if it's better then then it's by all means i think it's so i i think yeah i don't think we can live by those by those kind of hard and fast rules because yep. it's it's just at what at what level do you um yeah do you do you address it it's uh mm -hmm. um you know obviously um really talking about your you know your your um background and i mean certainly you know traveling has a profound influence on the way you you see things and do things and you see ideas and you there's this there's exactly as you said the cross pollination it's uh i think it's i think it's human nature yeah it's one planet, people. We're on one planet. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, you had also previously mentioned that you got your use of technology in the office is maybe one of your strengths. Um, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So um, maybe uh, just kind of on a on the vein that we were just discussing in terms of the the clients. Uh, I think you know this model of ours where we where we are. Doing the the the, up, the design work up to design development, you know, we've had to, we we really changed and adapted our um, documentation and the way that we present buildings, and we we do recognise that you know a lot of our clients are very in their times in huge demand. They're very busy. Um, they uh, a lot of it is done in these calls, and so the the meetings need to be. In a format and a uh, and at a pace that they can engage with, understand, and make decisions and give them comfort. So, so mm -hmm. we really kind of looked at that and 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 developed that in many ways. And and the backbone to that is obviously being um, being able to present things in a more three dimensional format, which is obviously nothing new. And Revit forms the, the sort of 
the backbone um, the backbone to that. Um, but obviously through that we're also able to input all the data which in which is obviously the um, the topography and we can load in the sort of uh, cityscapes and the, the key kind of view areas which is which is very important and uh, is kind of always a fairly early point of departure for us is just to understand you know what are the assets of the of the of the property and you know what what where are the views and how are we going to incorporate them and and then that obviously gets led with um with all the all the kind of aspect environmental considerations as as well um and, and so that that that's obviously key for us um as a and from a design point of view um you know, we were quite early adopters in um in virtual reality we actually developed our own um, virtual reality tool, which we thought was going to be more valuable than our than our practice, and it's just taken like <laughs> twelve years for anyone to buy a headset. So it kind of it uh, it burned a little bit, but we um, but hmm. we are, are now we're now we're now using Enscape um, instead of using our, our tool because we couldn't we couldn't keep um, managing and and, uh, and updating it. Hmm. Um, but that's been quite a that's been quite a, an amazing. Um, exercise for us and you know the it's one thing being able to look at the renderings and kind of assess the spaces and the and the, and the scale and proportion of the building but to you know to actually stand in the space in quite a crude early model and, and make decisions based on uh, on on kind of your um perception of standing in a space was, was really was was really quite powerful so we, we we've done um, that, that's that's become quite important in the uh, in, in the office as well. So are, um, are you talking about and, VR as a, um, I, I would have guess in two ways, one as a t internal design tool that you guys are using to think through things, but also as a presentation tool? Um, we do use it as a presentation school, a tool. We are a little bit more cautious on that because it's um, it doesn't always work the way he wants it. It's a little bit more of a kind of endless string, and sometimes not not curated enough. I mean, sure, if you end at the end of a design journey, then that's no problem. But you know, early on, you you kind of want the clients, your your clients, to engage and see the the things that matter early, not be worried about you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so 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 we we quite enjoy. Uh, we we often use as a presentation tool more of a kind of fixed point 3d uh, 360 panoramic image that's that we find um quite useful and for the right clients we will we would certainly would also um do the do the virtuality but it's it, it, you need to find the right sort of time during yeah. the design process on that but but what i was referring to earlier was was more an internal design tool that like quite early super crude you know jump into the model and have a look and you can then kind of quite quickly um move things around so that 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 was um, that that's been working quite quite well for us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially for the interior spaces, because it's just so hard sometimes to feel it unless you're in it or you know virtually. Yeah. In. Yeah. Um, a moment ago, you mentioned for the presentation side though that you do was it a fixed point three hundred and sixty view? So is that a static image or is it like a that's a static image. It's essentially, essentially you, you're standing inside a cylinder with the image placed on the inside. So it's 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 not like virtual reality where you can where you can hop or fly around. It's just a um, it's it's just a still image um, okay. that you can then kind of turn turn your head um, I see. 360 degrees to have a look around. That's okay, cool. I see. I see. Yeah, um, I I definitely understand your point about some of the challenges or dangers of using VR uh, kind of early on in the design process as a presentation tool. It's a question I ask because uh, some architects we know say they use VR and I'm always like, how do you do that? Because yeah. the point that you brought up is always the first issue of that. Not everything has been figured out. And a lot of times it's like, I want to show you client this one thing and it's this is evocative of other things that are going to happen yet, but we haven't resolved it yet because we don't want to spend time mm -hmm. fully designing something that's not the right avenue. And uh, yeah, it is a risk for someone to swing their head and be like, why is that there? Like, don't, don't look over there. <laughs> don't look at that yeah. window. <laughs> or, 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 they, or they hate the sofa that someone's stuck in the corner yeah. of the room and then the presentation's over. <laughs> yep. Yeah, half an hour presentation's talking about fabric selections. You're like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I hate that color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Um, but so for you personally, coming right out of school, you started working at Sayota right after you graduated. Is that right? Yeah. So the, the, the structure here is you do an undergrad for three years. You do a year out. You meant to work for six months and do some traveling, and then you go back to your postgraduate. So hmm. in my year out, I worked for um, – a uh, young firm uh, at the time, um, Makeka Design Laboratory. I had a fantastic year. It was um, you know, young black architects just doing amazingly well, but it was super lean. And I was, you know, doing let making letterheads. And you know, after three years of I, I was so it was it was it was amazing. And I and I learned an incredible amount. But it was you know it was really kind of had a, we were it was so early in the. Um, in the in the phases of it that I um I I'm sorry and I continued to work for them for him through my postgraduate and then uh Stefan saw my final project at uh at, uh in my postgrad and offered me and offered me a job and then I was kind of in a dilemma um <laughs> because I had such a good relationship with with um with McKenna and uh but at the same time I felt like Sarita was a little bit of the opposite of where I'd come, where I was, where it was kind of, you know, everything was being made as we, as we, as we went to something that was very structured, very organized. And so mm. it kind of seemed like a, um, like a, a good kind of de developmental move to, um, to, to go and have a look. And, um, so I joined straight out of, um, straight out of school. Um, and I was working for Philip at the time who, um, it's been an incredible mentor um, for me, and uh, yeah, he just had a he had a sixth sense. He kind of knew when I was uh, getting tired or getting itchy or getting thinking about going to uh, going to study in New York, and you know, with, uh, <laughs> promotion here and, <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and then and then um, and then yeah, I mean, at that time of that Miami project was uh, was also just a. Uh, um, a great phase of my life. I uh, got married. We were having our first kid, and and I could just feel that this thing was taking off. And uh, and so I was really very fortunate, you know, being at the in the right place at the right time. And um, and it was kind of at that point. At that point, do I am I, am I all in here, or am I, you know, am I going to try and do this on my own? And yeah, I could just feel that we were we were really on a kind of upward trend and and kind of uh, committed and um, yeah, it's been it's been excellent. So uh, it's been um, it's been fun. I was just going to say um, w one note on on your story, which I think was very interesting and, and I think smart is to choose to go to an office that's different from what you've had experience before. I think is really interesting. I at one point made a similar transition where I was used to being in smaller offices, and then there was an opportunity to work at a, a, a like way way larger one. Um, and just to even even like for for younger architects, I think even experiencing a, a bigger office, even if it's a, for a shorter period of time, is like quite useful to to see how things can be run or should be run and the infrastructure that's required to have a machine like this. I mean, the size that you guys were when you joined to even now, uh, that's a massive, you said you were like about 60 people or so when you joined ish. And then now you're 250. both are large sizes, yeah. but that amount of growth is, that's a lot. Yeah, no, it's been, the growth has been huge. I mean, the, the one little, um, What's important to maybe understand is the way the office functions is really um, more like a collection of studios than mm -hmm. a than a big office. So I think the the structure of having these teams and 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 you know there's yes yeah, so there's seven principles, but there's also probably twenty seven people in mid management who are extremely talented architects and people, and so there's a really good infrastructure of, of kind of leaders throughout the, the office. And so even though the office is 250 and my team's 45 or whatever it is for the, for the person who's joining straight out of school and joining the, the office, they, they, their team is, you know, is, is really probably in the realm of kind of, you know, five to mm -hmm. 13 people. So 
it it is a big office, but it, and and we and as much as we we hate the word corporate, it, it is obviously it is it is a corporate structure because of the, the sheer size of it. But in terms of how it functions, it's not actually that um, that radical. And there is a high proportion of residential work in the in, in in the office. So you generally are working with kind of you know three to four people on a project, which you also like to do because we don't like to you know that that burden of having it all sitting on your yeah. on your shoulders which you sometimes feel at a younger firm is, is also not a not a, a good experience and within a group of three or four people you can also be juggling a few projects which is the other beauty of our of our mo- model is that um you know when you when you're doing a construction project that's a you know, that's a four-year commitment of your uh, you know of your life where the where these ones are a little bit more fluid so so it's got a it's got a, a couple of positives that it, I think the, the the size of it isn't you, you know you aren't on a team of thirty working on a project and you, you know you, where you can really get lost and and I think you <laughs> being able to have that being able to have that variety I think is a is a, is a positive thing as well. Um, and so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting setup. I mean, I, I, we often talk about you, you know the. Um, you know who are we similar to, and uh, and and it's it is quite unique to be to be with, with this kind of uh, structure and business model that we that we've ended up at in in Cape, from Cape Town. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like in a way you sort of get the best of both worlds because one of the challenges, of course, when you're a smaller office is just the instability. It only takes a few things to sink the ship, uh, but when you're mm-hmm. at the two fifty size, if things are running properly, you know there's there's a little more, I wouldn't say slack, but there's a little, a little more buffer in, in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 you know, look, we, we are very um, meticulous about all the sort of business aspects of the of, of the business, and we're very aware of what's happening, and uh, and and that that is where we are. Also, extremely fortunate is you know I mentioned that period where. LA took off for us. I think the preceding mm-hmm. three years, Lagos was incredible, and then oil price tanked and it like disappeared. And you know we've had Miami and then Dubai, and so it's what what's what is really great for us is that we, you know, we do have a little bit of that slack where we could we can kind of you know move to the the areas that that kind of need the resor- the resourcing mm-hmm. resourcing most, um, and and manage it in that way that you aren't. Um, yeah, that you aren't beholden to those few little ripples, of, like you say, in a smaller practice that can really, um, that can really hurt you. I mean, of course, <laughs> if, the, if, the, if at that at our, at our size, if the if there's broader sort of uh, uh, very macro things that start happening everywhere, that that's a kind of different story. And obviously, sure. when COVID hit, we all feared the worst. And ironically, it's you know we've we've and feel feel bad with, as it was so terrible for so many but you know we we've we've we came through that surprisingly well and um have actually kind of been grown in that period so it's um yeah it's it's uh it's interesting and um long may it last do you guys go ahead it's actually it's actually a very interesting business model to not just be doing local work and even beyond that like in different countries because you don't put all your eggs in the same basket. So if the right, if the, yeah. the economy of that country goes down, you're you're not you know sinking your ship. Like mm-hmm. you you still have other places that could keep you afloat. So I think it's uh, you know that architect who only wants to do local work. I think that's not sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> I was wondering if you guys have any plans, or you think that you're going to grow in the office size, the number of people. Um, <clears throat> I'll. We could be growing. We we could be growing more as things stand today. Um, we are kind of at the point. Well, well, sorry. What's also one of the biggest reasons we grew in the COVID period was we were office based prior, and now we are um, hybrid model, predominantly work from home. Mm-hmm. Oh. What that's allowed us to do is to employ a lot of people in other South African cities. So we've got. You know, um, people sitting in Johannesburg or Pretoria or Durban or Port Elizabeth, or um, 
And so that's that's been allowed us to grow because Cape Town is is quite a small place, and so we, you know, in terms of numbers of of, of people, that was kind of our biggest um, sort of restrictor. We so I say that on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, we are a little bit nervous. I mean, if the work's there to support it, that you know, that's that's fine, and we we'll do it. But I, I think we would also like to be trying to you know refine the projects we work on maybe be trying to kind of grow through other means rather than kind of just purely on the same sort of a model that we that we're on at the moment um but i think there is probably still um but there is a likely growth of probably another sort of 15 percent i would say well wow. that's that's a healthy percentage <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yeah. Do you find, so it sounds like some of the employees are maybe fully remote, remote like the majority mm. of the time. Do you find that it's difficult to, on the kind of creative side of design, have coherency or have the productive kind of meetings and conversations when people are split in different places? No, I mean... <laughs> We, we get asked this before, and I would never pretend to say that it's perfect, but it's actually been almost the opposite for us. You know, what we, we were, and it's in this process of kind of growing and learning to deal with the size and, you know, these five teams and these five studios. And, and at a point in time, it kind of felt like maybe the five studios were maybe slightly going in different different tangents. But, hmm. you know, when you have the size that, we, that we're at, it's it's – very difficult to get that many people into a, into a room. So, <laughs> what what we've actually got now is, you know, when we have our um, we call them rad sessions. This is uh, research, analyze, design, and that would be, for instance, my team presenting what we've got on on the boards to the sort of senior management across the across the office. And so you've got you know probably thirty people joining joining that call and and we have they're, they're amazing and we discuss the projects and everyone has their say and you know they can, they can get pretty um pretty robust which is fun in a, in a good way and um but it's it's excellent and it's great for everybody to be able to see that and now that that is done on a format that can get recorded and shared with the rest of the office and, and you can come back and reference it and so we've just found that it's actually allowed us to actually do the opposite in terms of consolidate a lot of these ideas and so that that happens kind of every month across all the all the five teams and um so so i think it's been um i think it's been great uh, from a, from a design point of view i think it's been great so i think you know i do um worry about the like um people straight out of school and, you know, picking up a random drawing at the printer and having a, 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 a but, uh, but at the same time, they don't want to be in the office, which, so which is the, which is the, you know, the, the, the irony of it. And the office is there. So, so there is a, there's a, there's a group of people who, who are there and enjoy it and uh, want to, want to do it. So I think, and, and there's de definitely an element of it that, you, you know, we do, uh, we do work hard, and and I think that the um, that the work from home has given um, people a little bit more um, sense of control of their of their day. I mean, we also, you know, my 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 team, not in particular because the time zones apply wherever people are. But you know, with the US work, we we tend to end up working a little bit late, so mm -hmm. you know they can kind of make that make that work, which which I think helps. So. Yeah, for us, the positives have far outweighed any 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 negatives. It's actually, I think, taken us to um, to a, a new level, and um, and it's and it's working great. We this year we um, we've been uh, inspired by some some friends of a lighting consultant in Mexico City. I went to an event a few years ago where they invited a whole lot of colleagues. You anyway, know, this this year we we're doing an office event where we've got. Um, everybody coming to Cape Town for three days for a kind of big get together, which is the first time we've um, we, we, we've done that in a while. And so it's also finding a lot of those events. I mean, a little bit of a side story is, you know, there's Sarota, um, we, we There's a technically three separate companies. Um, we call it within our group of companies: Sarota, Arc, A R R C C, and Oka, 
OKHA. Um, Arc is an interior um, design firm, and Oka is a um, furniture retailer. So between between all um, between all three firms, we are um, actually sitting at I think the number is three hundred and seventy people. Oh wow! So 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 it's a, it's a big organization, and and um, so so that's going to be that's going to be fun to have uh, to have everybody um, together for, for for that event. Wait, so in the third uh office or third leg is the architecture office and uh, no so so it's says architecture and then arc is they're separate companies um uh um arc does um more interior projects so okay. they, they focus on interior architecture and interior decor so it's a, also we also do interior architecture it's just depends what clients are, are are looking for but we are we are three separate companies um but we we share the same office and there's a lot of kind of similarities and um, between but just in terms of the broader organization and, and the way um we, we kind of work the the three companies are, are quite intertwined oh i see okay interesting 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 um also the are the majority of your guys's projects single family houses because it might be that's how we know you i don't know if that's how the office is mo known by most people. Um, and then what other types of projects do you guys do? Yeah. So, yes, I'd say the majority is, is single family. I mean, that certainly is, um, how we've built our, our, our reputation and, and, and certainly the bread and butter of the, of the business. Um, I think the, you, you, probably be a little bit surprised in terms of the, the volume of other work, but it's probably a, about a 65, 35 split. Um, we do quite a bit of work, sort of hospitality work. And I think our kind of high-end residential feeds into a mm -hmm. lot of that mm -hmm. sort of realm. So that's, that's kind of a natural fit for us. Um, we've done some, we do do some commercial work, but you know, the, again, my, my custom comments is, you know, we, we, yeah are not every developer's cup of tea, of course, for the, for the right developer, that that's what they're trying to do. It, it, you know, it works. Um, and, and, uh, so, so there's a fair range, but it's predominantly, um, single family residential and, and hospitality projects. Gotcha. 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 Do you find that, um, I mean, I can certainly understand the, the tie between single family and hospitality, but still, do you find that there are some different challenges when you do hospitality that you know you can't that it's not a direct transfer uh, from one side to the other? Yes, I mean, I, I think um, I think a lot of the time it's 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 not too different to to any project, but you know, managing that managing managing the setup of the of the of the full team is often quite a you know quite a challenge and getting the right inputs from the right people at the right times is is always is is always a little bit uh, tough and i think as soon as you got one of these operators at the table you you kind of are, are realizing how you know specific and how, how scientific a lot of the um the operations of these of these things are i mean i think we've We've got a fair bit of experience in them now that we we kind of know our way around, but um, but it but it is it is it is always fascinating how um, how these things almost you know design themselves from a from a from a briefing point of view. <laughs> right. I mean, we, we obviously uh, we, we we also are it's are not generally kind of doing sort of run of the mill, um, hotels, which, which plays in our, our favor somewhat, because then sometimes some of those, those ideas are, are challenged, are challenged in terms of the, um, which is, which, which is good. But, um, yeah, I mean, we, we always are looking to bring sort of high design, um, to the, to these projects, which for the right project works at other times, it, it obviously can, can be a little bit of a, a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. My last question would be, what what is next for you guys? Is there like a country that you're trying to get into? <laughs> is there like a super exciting project that you can maybe tell us a little bit about? Or like what... Or a different project type that yeah. hasn't happened yet? Or um, Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, um, we, 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 we really, I think, you know, we... Um, 
to think that us in Cape Town um, to be working on six continents and 150 odd cities. I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite mind blowing. Um, and so we count ourselves very, very, very lucky. I think, you know, we, I think what's next for us is, is obviously, you know, we really try and make sure that our, um, we, we keep pushing the design aspects of our, of our projects to be, um, keeping ourselves relevant and, um, and, and to be able to keep kind of working in such a, a amazing places. I think, I think it's also hopefully kind of starting to elevate some of the, some of the, um, some of the projects. I think maybe, um, in the past, you know, we too quickly ac accept some projects. And, and so I think it's, it's also now going through a little bit of a process of distilling of what's going to allow us to kind of, um, you know, create the, and the next phase of, of work that's going to kind of suit what we um, what what we're looking to do um, from a from a project type point of view, um, I think we we do enjoy the um, you know the, the the right kind of of hospitality work. I think you know we we would love to be um, you know involved in some projects that have a, a bit of of a more sort of um, civic scale in, you know, maybe, maybe something that, that were something like a museum that we could kind of, you know, try, try our hand at or, or mm -hmm. something along those lines where we could really try and take a lot of, I think some of the emotive quality of the building of the design aspects we try to bring to our current projects and, and take that into, a, you know, a more sort of profound experience and, um, a, a, along those, along those sort of lines. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. I think we've we've had a fantastic start in a lot of these regions. I think we um, now now is kind of the phase where we really um, sort of consolidate and, and do work that shows that we um, that we belong, and um, and then kind of really keep keep kicking on from there. Last question for me is sometimes the most difficult oh, no. one. Uh, what is your favorite building? Yeah, that, that is that is a, an extremely uh, a difficult uh, a question. And I was chatting to my kids before this. My six-year-old said, "Asked me that question," and I said, "You know what? They're definitely going to ask me that question." But but, but I, I, he said pro, he said project. So in my mind, I was thinking about my my work projects. I hadn't thought about building ever. Um, so yeah, that's that's a difficult one. But the, there's. Um, the one that really uh, uh, stands out in my mind, and just because uh, Philip and, and, and I were, we were actually working on a project, um, which is in the Dominican Republic, and the client at the time was living in um, Kansas City. And so we, we had to go and meet there, and I never in my no offense, but it was never something that I ever thought that I would <laughs> sure. go to. And I didn't know. So of course, you know, I hop online like I do everywhere I go. And I'm going, you yeah. know, um, architecture buildings in Kansas City and I pop the Nelson Atkins uh, Museum. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was, that was just because it happened so like sporadically. And it was obviously, I explained my Stephen Hall um you know student days and so that was that was quite special um and the other one which is maybe a little bit more obscure was also when i was in my between my studies and i i um i used to go work in london during my my summer holidays middle of london winter to to make money to pay for the year and i went and saw the levan dance center by herzog and the mirror in in, uh, in, in london mm. and uh which is which is probably not one of their best buildings, but um, it was the first time I think I kind of got a, a glimpse of you know of, of what they what they're about and what they do and, and what you, how you can take uh, you know do something uh, uh, amazing with the building. They have the, the, the building. I, I don't know if you know it. It's kind of that polycarbonate uh, shaded structure, and there's a, a ramp on the inside, and they um got this kind of handrail that weaves and undulates along the and uh yeah it was just it was uh it was uh quite a quite a fun experience so 
could never could never commit to those being my favorite buildings, but I'd say those are those are two highlights. <laughs> That's fair enough. That, that counts nice. as an answer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Mark, thank you so much for making the time, uh, especially uh, this late at night for you, uh, midday for us. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. No, my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, appreciate uh, you guys doing the show and what it uh, what it gives us all to uh, um, back to the back to the profession. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support our show by hitting that subscribe button and liking and commenting on our videos. You can also find us on most of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're mostly on Instagram. And you can reach out to the hotline, 213-222-6950. You can send a text message or leave a voicemail if you have any reaction to this recording, any questions you might have or guest suggestion, feel free to send it our way. Cool. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.